watching this astronaut from the space shuttle talking about what Earth looked like to him from above. When they look at Earth from above, they're having a hard time telling the countries apart from each other because the lines that are in the maps are not on the ground. I dream of the day when all lines fade away and we finally realize we are one people living on this one magical, beautiful place we call Earth. I'd like to thank Mr. Yari and adopting and the Grand Panda. I accept this gift with great humility and a profound sense of responsibility towards the country of China. This is the gift of a lifetime. I just want you to remember that everything great that has ever happened to humanity has begun as a single thought in someone's mind. Now, uh, I know that our world is going through a very difficult time right now, but I will never lose my faith in humanity and our incredible ability to overcome just about anything. There is nothing that we cannot do when we all come together as one. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Yanni. Hello, everybody. <laughs> all right. All right, so I'm watching that film, seeing all these places you've been. Yeah. I love travel. I love going to places like that. I go to them a little bit differently than you do, so I don't get to step out on a stage. But when you, when you step out on a stage at the, outside the Taj, at the Taj Mahal or in the Forbidden City of China or at Carthage, the old ancient Carthage, any place like that, how does that impact you as an artist, what you're going to do in that performance. Oh my God, it's, it's such a powerful experience. I mean, to have the Taj Mahal behind you, your backdrop, um, and know that you're the only person who's ever done that in history. We were the only ones who were ever allowed to even light it. We, it's never been lit at night. Um, it's, uh, I remember it, it was full moon or close to it, and uh, we're getting ready to go on about 30 seconds before we a uh, live television audience in India of 250 million people. I wasn't nervous at all. <laughs> 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 but it is it's just an amazing, all that stuff is just surreal now when you think of it. And it begins as a single thought. It's, it's, a, it's a want, a, a desire. I, I have this desire. Uh, it's very strong. I wanted to be at the Taj Mahal. It was one of those. It took two years, though, to get it done. When is, when is that much, was that much involved in, in doing that? When to get there by the time? Get, I think I may need. Uh, do I need the other mic here? Hello, hello. Yes. Um, when when you've put all that to do it and you get on stage, do you just clear your mind and you say, "This is where I am, and this is now who I am in this space right now." Yeah, or when I, whenever I, I get in, in any concert, it doesn't matter if there's 400 people or 400,000 people, it's the same thing, I, I become one. I, I try to connect to the audience and have them touch me and I touch them and become one. And it's, it's very uh, extreme focus. If you lose your focus in this type of music that we're playing and I'm playing with some of the best musicians in the whole world, it's, uh, you're lost. 
Then I play from memory, I don't read anything. I run the whole concert, all the notes, all everything is in here. And uh, if you lose your focus, it's over. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> Well, that's pretty incredible. You can keep your focus and look behind you, and there's you know, whatever you're seeing there, Taj Mahal, or yeah, it, it is. Um, you know, I, there's magic in everything. There's a, there are certain moments in my life, like the Acropolis concert, or um, the, thank you, one applause. <laughs> Great. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm thinking a couple people here have seen it, so. <laughs> I can't believe you fell for that one. <laughs> <laughs> Too easy. <laughs> anyway, we've done these amazing shows. We've been in places that no other um, person has ever been allowed to perform at in history, ever. It's pretty magical, these things, and, and you don't know what to expect, but it's pretty amazing to learn about the world in that fashion because you're there. It's one thing to... Uh, um, read about a place like Tunisia. It's another thing to be there and see the people and, and breathe their air and eat their food and live, you know, feel it. It's the uh, best way I can say it is just because you've watched a uh, safari on uh, television, it doesn't mean you've seen a lion. If the lion walked in right here, right now, now you're seeing a lion. <laughs> Because you, your reaction is completely different. First of all, your heart rate goes up. <laughs> um, you were, earlier, you were telling me about just the last couple of months of what, what your life has been like, where you've been, all these places, some that we've mentioned, some uh, you've been to Space City. Uh, when did you, when was the panda? When was that? Yeah, the panda, I mean, she's now, her name is Santorini, and she's two and a half years old. Yeah, okay. So it's going to be, uh, it's, oh, go. yeah. <laughs> but something that I would like you to know is that the, the pandas are an extremely um, endangered species. No one can buy a panda. And um, it's a very powerful symbol for the Chinese people. Um, they only lease them to countries only, not individuals or personalities, on a yearly basis. Uh, I'm the only human being that they have allowed to adapt a baby panda. And they asked me to name it. Yeah. It's, a, it's a great honor because they consider it as a, a symbol of peace, or you might say an equivalent of the Nobel Peace Prize. And it, was, um, it really touched my heart. And the Chinese have been great to me since we went there the first time in the Forbidden City in 97. And we've been there quite a few times. And they have been extremely honorable. They, all my experiences have been amazing. I have been very fortunate you know, in all the places we've ever been, no exceptions. Um, they, they have honored me. Every time I go to that country, they honor me. They find ways. When, uh, even when my mother came to see me perform at the Forbidden City, they closed it down so that she could go by herself and walk through it. And it's a, it's a long thing to do. And back then, my mother was ailing, and she wasn't walking very well. And it was, it was an amazing, you know, it really touched me very much. Well, you, I mean, just when you had things like that, and just in the past couple of months, you've had some incredibly profound experiences, one-of-a-kind experiences. As a creative person, as an artist, huh. how does all that sort of thing, I mean, again, your, your career has been a, a series of profound <laughs> experiences, how does that feed into your creative process, into your art? How do, these things aren't just things you experience and move on from, They're, they, they must become part of you as an artist. Yeah, that's the fuel right there. You put it right in the most important uh, part. It's, it's life, you know, you live life, then you have something to talk about. It changes you, all these experiences, you never get to go and see and do these things and come out unchanged. You can't just go to India and uh, you think you're going to walk out of there unchanged. It changed your life forever. You see so many things. It's, it's the second largest city, uh, I mean, country in the world. China, the same thing. Um, Russia, 
would be in all over South America. I, I, I cannot even East, Western Europe, uh, America, Canada, <laughs> uh, Brazil, and many, many cities in Brazil, and, and Argentina, and Chile, and keep going. Um, all these cultures affect you. They touch you. They, they, you get surprised a lot of times. We've been in the Middle East too, many places in the Middle East. Um, and it's fuel for creativity. It's fuel for writing music. I, it's, it's my, I feel it's my responsibility to communicate the knowledge that I've accumulated. Um, and I consider it a gift. I mean, I could never imagine as a kid that something like that would be happening to me. It's pretty amazing. That actually uh, feeds into a question that we've gotten from, from one of your fans uh, watching this uh, live. And this is from Christine from Utah. And, uh, she asks, being a creative soul, is your mind constantly working? Are you able to quiet your mind? And if so, how? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. Yeah, it, it is difficult to learn how to quiet, quiet your mind down. So, um, it took me years. And um, I, I love talking about creativity, and, and, and really, it's a frame of mind. It's a, it's a place of surrender. Creativity, I have said this before, creativity is an inherent human quality of the highest order. We all have it. We all have the ability. We may not have the understanding of how it functions inside us or how to bring it out or about. Uh, and it works the same for writers. You know, there's nothing worse for a writer to be standing there with a blank piece of paper. What's the first word that you're going to write? Or for me, what's the first sound? What's the first note? And it's a, 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 you completely surrender and you become one, at least I do, I become one with the music. And I don't have to play the piano to write music. I just hear it. It comes. I go into the black. All Everything that I don't know, all the music that I'm going to write from now on and forever, it's in the black, it's in the unknown. So I befriend the unknown and I stand there and I open my heart to it and it comes. And you must not judge it. Judgment and creativity are opposites. They cannot exist together. Because as soon as you judge what's coming in, you're outside looking at yourself, and the creative moment has just ended. So you're looking for the next note, and it's not there. And then I get to sit around for another week trying to manufacture a song, and I couldn't do it. And I'm talking when I was in my early 20s learning this. Now, about 30 years later, um, I didn't want to say that part. <laughs> <laughs> I get to go there, it's much easier, and I get to stay there for long periods of time. But it, you might call it being in the zone, it's just a complete surrender, that's it. Yeah, a lot of what you do is an individual, it is a solo uh, process, but much of what you do, and perhaps recently even more of what you do has been collaborative. Your, your latest album, Inspirado, is a very collaborative album in, a way, in ways you really haven't done before. Could you talk a little bit about the process of doing that and some of the special people you worked with and what your, was there a letting go process in doing that and letting, having these wonderful people do oh, their yeah. part? Yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, you, you're talking about Inspirato, correct? Yes. Um, yeah, that was an amazing process. Actually, I was working with the best vocalists the, on the whole planet, so really they don't need a lot of direction. In fact, I heard at the beginning they were talking about Placido Domingo. I was just with him at my hotel uh, about an hour and a half ago. I came downstairs and we, we had to talk for a little bit. And he was going for his rehearsal. Tomorrow he's got his uh, premiere about a mile away from Nokia where I'm going to be playing at the same time. It's a small world. <laughs> you two should Skype during it. Yeah, I wish I, we, yeah we talked about it. That would be fun. Um, it, a lot of times I, I run, uh, we run across each other. Like um, you showed some pictures early, earlier from Oman. He was there about a week after I got there. Um, and he had opened their opera house. And uh, we've been doing playing tag around the world 
anyway, no. It, it, it was so, your question is great. It was just a pleasure. It just took a long time. It took me four years to create this album. Because um, these music, these, these vocalists are the best in the world. Renee Fleming, for example. You just saw her recently uh, do the national anthem and the Super Bowl. And I think number one voice in the whole world, right there. Plus the Domingo. Number one voice in the whole world, male. <laughs> There's only one. Um, so, and it goes on, and there are a lot of people on this album. Um, very special, easy to let go. I think of music as being liquid. It's not something that uh, it's stiff, you know. As soon as you put it on a CD, um, it's, it freezes. It's like a, a frozen moment in time. It's like taking a picture of a wave of an ocean. The ocean, it keeps evolving and the waves keep coming, but you take a picture, it just freezes it. That's what an album is. Live performances, though, on the other hand, they evolve and they change. They're never the same, no matter what you do. Many of the vocalists who said on this album, we don't really need to elaborate about because they're so well known. But there's one that, that really grabbed my attention, uh, grabbed a lot of people's attention on it. And I want you to tell the story of Pretty Yende. That, that story made me cry. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a very touching story. It's the story, it kind of reminds me of myself growing up in southern Greece uh, as a kid, having nothing essentially, and trying to figure out how to do music. Um, she was growing up in South Africa. I think, uh, forgive me, Andy, for, uh, if I get your age wrong, but she was about six years old. And I had done a, a commercial for British Airways. And I don't do a lot of commercials. But that particular one, run for four or five years, won a lot of the British awards. It was a very s successful commercial. And in it, I had done a version of a song. Um, we, I like to call it aria, because it's an aria from an opera. And I had adjusted it. Anyway, I like to call it aria. Um, and he was playing in South Africa, this six-year-old kid, female, was listened to it. And that sparked her interest in uh, singing and opera. And that's the only song she had. She could do, <laughs> watch it on TV, that was it. Whenever the commercial came on, she would hear that, and I want to do that, I want to do that. Fast forward however many years later, I can't tell you, it's a few. Now she has become one of the top uh, female opera singers in our planet. And um, she sings in, in Inspirato, and of course she sings Aria, and it's the best version I've ever had. Yeah. Spectacular. Yeah. It's, really, it's really spectacular. Yeah, it is. Thank you. But uh, I can see how you would, would relate to that, because you came from a place that was uh, a fairly small town, and you didn't speak any English when you came here. And uh, I'm, I am curious what music you were exposed to there? A lot. The, my musical diet is quite varied. It's, um, I, first of all, we didn't have a turntable or a tape recorder. So the only music I could hear it was on the radio. Um, and I was interested in, in varied music, not just Greek music. Um, and they were not playing a lot of European uh, music at the time, or classical, or anything like that that I was interested in. So at night, I would stay and I have a shortwave radio. And I, since I was living in southern Greece, I had access to all the music from Italy, Rome, you know, I could hear all the stuff, all the way to North Africa, Morocco, Middle East. And I would sit there and I listened to all these types of music. Um, and they would play English rock and roll, and sometimes you know, I would hear Abbiamo Trasmesso Musica Leggera, and I didn't know what that meant. That's Italian saying, we transmitted light Italian music, or whatever. And I would hear that, and it would bum me out, because that meant the radio station was turning off, and that was it. <laughs> and so uh, that's how I started. It, it was very... Uh, then when I came to America, of course, things changed. The world opened of up. Course. Um, this might be a good time to bring in our first video question that, that uh, was received here, if, if we've got that ready to go. Hi, Annie. This is Shirley from the United States, and I have a question for you. I love that your music contains elements from many different cultures and has the ability to heal, uplift, and create friendships among your fans from around the world. 
Your music and message of tolerance resonates within us. So, when you began composing, did you ever envision just how far-reaching your music would be? Thank you very much. Well, uh, not really. I never imagined uh, the, the, how far it would go. Of course, I had a dream. You have to dream first. The, the things don't just happen to you. You have to want it. You have to be passionate about wanting it too. It's like to create, you, you have to be forward. There has to be energy and passion. Um, but, you know, I, you don't want to be, you, I approached it with a humbleness. I think being humble is powerful. Um, and I thought if I do good work long enough, I will be discovered at some point. Took more than that. It took many, many years of a lot of um, a lot, a lot of hard work, and, and a lot of anonymity, you know, which uh, you know, it, it takes takes courage. Uh, when you get to be 30 years old, and and you really don't have enough money to feed yourself, or you know, I had to go live at my sister's house and write music in her basement, um, and it didn't bother me at all because I love music, I love creating, and I. Didn't spend too much time worrying about was I ever going to make it? I mean, think about it. This little Greek kid playing keyboards in America. Uh, you know, he's, he's, he, my possibilities, my possibilities of success were zero. That was it. <laughs> and it happened. It's, it's like a dream come true. Well, sometimes the most important things in, a, in life are not the things that do happen, but maybe sometimes the things that don't happen. So I want, I'm curious how you think things would be different if Chameleon had been a big hit, if Chameleon had been like the next journey or something. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. That would have been a lot of fun. However, something you don't know is that I had begun writing my own music even when I was producing a lot of the albums for Chameleon at the time. So that's where I learned how to perform live. It was a great experience, but this music needed to come out. Um, there came a time to where rock and roll was not going to be expressing the emotions that I needed to express. Um, it wasn't diverse enough. Maybe sometimes you get a little too aggressive. Um, and as you get older, you change, right? And as you change, what you create changes with you. So it would have been a parallel uh, career perhaps for a little bit, but do you think you would have still ended up how you ended up with if, if, if Chameleon had, had really been a big international hit? Well, it's, you know, it's hypothetical. You know, you change one small little thing in your life and you change your entire life. You know, we're talking about, I can't answer the question. <laughs> I mean, it would have been amazing. We wanted to. We wanted to succeed beyond the Midwest that we, we were successful at. Um, it never happened. I left, and um, six months later, I got signed as a solo artist, and that's how my career got started. I got lucky again. See, it's like no fear. And then I came out to Los Angeles. That was another big leap of faith. Um, and again, my chances of success were zero, don't forget that. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Well, now talking about things that, uh, that may be not in one's control, we have another question here that I'd like to ask okay. from, from uh, that, that sent in. This is from Heidi from Mexico. Heidi asks, how did you feel when the power failed at the concert in Izamal, Izamal Mexico? Remember how all the people started singing a cappella with you? Oh, God, I forgot about that. <laughs> you know, it's life, folks. You know, sometimes things don't work. <laughs> the, your power goes out, the, some, something quits, some keyboard overheats, and it won't play. And yeah, we lost power in front. And it was awesome. It was so beautiful. The, it, it, was, it just happened, this concert. It was pretty recent. Um, and the audience was so phenomenal. They, you know, you tend to think, Five minutes is a long time, right? In the middle of a concert, actually towards the end it happened, if I'm not mistaken. Um, that they would be disappointed or upset about, no, they started singing, <laughs> doing the wave, the whole thing. Is <laughs> they entertained themselves. It ended up great. The moral of the story is that, you know, life is unpredictable. You're out of control. 
You know, it's not the studio. You can't rewind and re-record it and fix it. Um, and that's the beauty of it. And, I, you know, to all those people out there who are live performers or dreaming of becoming live music performers or whatever, it's like the audience is there to support you. They're not there against you. They're with you. They want to see you succeed. So you relax. And, you know, the power came. Of course, I was praying a lot. <laughs> it was great. Yeah, I mean, on on that note, you've played some places in the uh, recent past where you wouldn't necessarily think that people were that familiar with your your music. Where they, you know, maybe your records hadn't been a big big process. You'd never been to South America, I believe, until you went to Brazil. Is that correct? Yes. In Tunisia, true. how do you, you know, you can't. Never. What record sales there, yeah. I don't think we've ever sold one record in Tunisia. I think they all get it from uh, YouTube. But they, they, knew they you know all the songs. They but knew they all the songs. How, how was I mean, did you expect that when you walk out and people are, know all the songs and clearly... No. Yeah. It was Tunisia. i got to tell you something. This, this is a heart tugger. A lot of us took a couple of weeks to get over it. It really touched our hearts. We went there when the country was in mourning. They had had a horrible incident. A few people got killed. And so the whole country was in mourning. And they continued, they opened their festival with me. Um, I had a choice. I could cancel or go, and I chose to go. And they were asking me, weren't you afraid to go? No. This is what we are about. We went there. The concert would start at 10.30 at night. We had something like 27,000 people came. Um, and w they made us cry. They started chanting Yanni, Yanni, Yanni from 6 o'clock in the afternoon. And <laughs> I'm sitting in my dressing room listening to all these people going crazy four and a half, five hours before the concert was going to even start. And I'm thinking, they're going to get tired by the time I go on stage. They're going to go, <laughs> forget it, forget it. They were so lovely. They touched our hearts. and. My, you know, I don't know how to explain this. You have to be there again. I didn't know exactly how to do this concert because um, I, I am picking up uh, uh, at the point in time in a country's very difficult moment. What do you play? What do you say? Hi, let's have some fun. Let's all dance. Or do you just go along with our morning and, and begin with, I'm um, so sorry this happened. And, what I chose to do, and it took me a long time to make this decision, I chose to become a mirror to them so they can see themselves, how great a country they are and they are, and how great these people are and they are. And all of a sudden, it turned around, they saw themselves and they went, that's right. We are great people. This is a great country. Nobody's going to control us. We're going to do whatever we want to do. We're going to be listening to the music we want to. Everybody out. And that's exactly what happened. We just changed. I think we changed the mood of an entire nation over a period of two nights. It was pretty amazing. It, I left and I, in tears. It just took all of us weeks to get over it. I mean, People have ascribed some pretty powerful things to your music, things like that, pe bringing people in pain together, uh, bringing them out mm -hmm. of pain, well, personal, in personal pain, out of that. Um, I would th does knowing that you have that role, does, I mean, that, that seems like something that could almost mess with your head. It, it is it's a great responsibility. I think a lot. I have to be careful. Uh, I it, there's. I have been trusted by some of the most powerful nations in the world. Uh, and it's a question of trust. They know I, I will do as I say. I have never been censored anywhere in the world I've ever played. No exceptions. Every country, every city, I say this during my concerts actually, nobody has ever tried to change my words or change my message. Nowhere. And, and that is an amazing statement to be able to make um, because it gives me hope for our future. It gives me hope for us, for humanity, for what's going to happen to us in the next few years. And we all know, I mean, our little 
planet right now is under considerable st stress. It's, um, you heard me say it earlier, I will never lose my faith in humanity and our incredible ability to overcome just about anything that we're challenged with. That's it. Yeah. And maybe that's a good time for another video question from, uh, from one okay. of your fans. Hello, Yanni. I'm Naor. I'm from Israel. I'm a fan for about 10 years, I think. And uh, as a musician, I would like to ask you, how do you come up with your themes and melodies and how you orchestrate it into the orchestration? How do you choose which section of the orchestra will play each theme and each melody? What is your creative process? of this orchestration. Thank you for the music and waiting for your answer. <laughs> That's a very complicated question. <laughs> That's a great question. Thank you. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's actually quite simple uh, because I write music in my mind. I, I don't, I don't, I don't accidentally, I don't go on the piano and start playing and stumble across the melody and then try to make a song out of it. It's, remember what I told you earlier about the creative process. It comes to you, and it comes to you all at once. You know the whole thing. You know, w w how, how do you start a concert? What's the first thing you're going to hear? What's the first note? Um, once you know what the emotion is, the music comes. It's, it's, it's there. I've been doing it for so long. As far as deciding how the orchestrations go, which part of the orchestra is going to play what, and it's not uh, so easily ex uh, explainable, but it's not uh, very difficult either. It becomes very obvious. You know, if it's going to be a plucked sound, or if it's going to be a French horn sound, if you want something deep, it's going to be a trombone, or maybe a synthesizer gun down here, or if you want the drums, you want the flute, you want, if you do pretend, we, we did a song in China when we played in the Forbidden City called Nightingale. And it, I was inspired by a nightingale, a bird, nightingale, which has the most beautiful voice of any other bird in the world. I was in Venice, Italy at the time, if you can imagine that. And this bird kept coming outside my window and was, it was doing all this. And they, they're amazing if you've heard these birds. They make, they put all the other birds to shame. <laughs> and it, this bird, I don't know, male, female, uh, it was uh, singing certain melodies that were recognizable. I was there for five or six days. I kept hearing three or four melodies that were absolute, exact, good pitch, everything perfect. So I just realized that the Chinese flute on the high registers has the same sound as a nightingale. So I called my flutist, who is probably the best in the world, Pedro Eustache. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I said, you're going to think I'm crazy, but can you do the bird? <laughs> 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 anyway, we played around with it, and it ended up uh, writing the song Nightingale, which we love it. We love that song. It's beautiful. Do you ever just want to get together with some guys and jam? <laughs> we did that all the time when we were kids. I'm sure. Yeah. It was a mess. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, everybody gets louder and louder than everybody else, you know? <laughs> no, me, me, me. I play a little louder. Can't hear myself. What are you doing? <laughs> the guitar player always is loud. Always. The bass player, the loudest. The drummer, forget it. <laughs> Can't hear it. Well, drummers, yeah. <laughs> Except I have Charlie Adams with yeah, me. I know. I've been playing with him for 35 <laughs> years. Yeah. He's another one. He's one of the best in the world. He's a, he's a lifer. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, well, how about, I mean, do you ever, like, you know, go into a hotel and say, you know, I could, if I put on a hat and some glasses, I could just go sit at the piano and play some, like, show tunes on the, uh, some, some standards on the piano in the lounge and nobody would know? No, that thought never crossed my mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what, do you, what do you play for fun? What do you play just to, you know, either to practice or to limber up or just, just to have some fun? Actually, the one thing with the hat, I've, I've done it. I did it in Mexico one time because I can't, couldn't, in the old days, I couldn't go anywhere. I guess my long hair and the mustache and the whole thing. 
and we couldn't go anywhere. So all my friends felt sorry for me and said, you put a ponytail on you, put the hat, big sunglasses, we go into the local bar and we'll have some tequila, we'll have a good time. So I said, nah, they're going to pick me out in a second. And they go, no, no, nobody knows. It's dark in there. Don't worry. So we went. And um, we went to the back corner. And it was really dark. And the first thing that happened is people walked up to me, pulled the hat up, and went, <laughs> Yanni. <laughs> I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> Yanni. <laughs> this is cool. And that was the end of my career of going out. And <laughs> well, I mean, in, uh, okay, so, you, but when you just sit around and play, do you, do you, is there some stuff that you play just to amuse yourself that you're never going to, you know, just whether it's somebody else's songs or stuff you're fooling around with? Do you have any guilty pleasures? I don't even believe in guilty pleasures. Why be guilty if you like some music? I <laughs> if mean, it's if you pleasure, like music, yeah. it's uh. great. But, but do you have, like, things that you would want to play or things that you like to listen to that might be a surprise to, to both your fans and people who oh, are Oh, would fans? I listen to? I listen to everything. As long as it's, um, as long as it's on, honest. It comes out from the heart. Uh, country and Western, I listen to. I started listening to Don Williams back 20 years ago. I listened, of course, when I was eight or nine years old, I loved Bach. Now, why would an eight-year-old like Bach? But I did. Beethoven, Mozart, the Beatles, Led Zeppelin, I love, Aerosmith. I listened to techno. I, uh, sometimes, not always. But what's, I, uh, what's wrong with that? Yeah, nothing. There's nothing wrong with it. There's, there's a time, f um, what I'm trying to say is there's a time for every kind of music in the world. It just depends what your mood is at the time. And it's appropriate. Right? I, I, I'm well, a like rap, I'm not a huge fan of. But, but there's some <laughs> really, but, but you got to admit, there's some creative stuff happening that happens to that too. I mean, I'm musically omnivorous and I, you know, I, I want, to hear everything, but I assume yeah. you, I, if you have a musical mind, I mean, you must want to hear everything. everything. I, I listen to, I, I don't have, uh, I don't really judge music. I do, music is supposed to go right through you and, and really go right in your heart. And that's why I like instrumental music, because it bypasses your logic, it bypasses your brain, when it goes directly into your soul, into your heart, and it tugs at your strings. And it, within one second, I can change the mood. It's, uh, it's very obvious, I mean, when you're watching a movie, how powerful the music can be, right? One sound can make you scared or... It's that quick, a little bit, because it's um, learned responses that we have to frequencies of sound uh, since in our gene pools, since billions of years ago, a low vibration probably is a good idea to get scared and run away. It's probably a volcano or an elephant is coming. Yeah, you know, as soon as you hear love, you, get, you know what I mean? We have pre-programmed reactions to certain sounds. And, and I like to, if you don't have lyrics, uh, if your music is not reliant on lyrics, and most of mine is not, it's, um, you don't lose the message across borders because the language is not a, a, a barrier. You, and I've tested it all over the world, and, and the whole message translates. It just goes right across. Well, and, but of course you've been making a few albums now that do have vocals and lyrics, but of course I don't speak Italian, so uh, <laughs> yes. it's musical to me yeah, when exactly. I hear a lot of this. Yeah, I, me, me too. When I was starting, when I was in Greece and I was listening to all these songs, uh, Italian songs, English songs, Middle Eastern songs, Spanish songs, you know, mi everywhere from uh, Morocco, you know, I didn't understand the language at all, but I, I did get a lot of the message. I understood the melody. I listened to it as just musical. Let's take another from the, uh, that came in from, from a, a fan writing into us here. This is from Holly Robbie, or Holly Roby on Social Stream. The question is, what was the best advice you were given from your parents? Wow. That, there is no best. I, I was, I've been so fortunate with my parents. I had a most amazing mother. Uh, it was just a smile on her face, always. And um, just full of love and passion for life, for life and zest. Loved us to death. There's three of us. There's an older brother and a younger sister. Um, and my father was a, a philosopher. Um, he had a regular job, too. <laughs> <laughs> One but of those philosophers. Yes. Yeah. But he, he is calm, 
Um, we've never, you know, the, he never, I, I never remember raising my voice to him or him raising his voice to me, ever. It was always a conversation. And he was so intelligent, this man, and he was so studied. He spoke five languages, self-taught, been through World War II and the Civil War in Greece after that. So he's been through a war for 10 years. So people getting killed, so all the ugliness in the world that you could see. And he became this gentle, amazing human being that, you know, it's, it's stunning, stunning to me when once in a while he would open up at nights and describe some of the things he's experienced in his life, how gentle and how peaceful a human being he was. So with a father like that and a mother like that, I have no excuses. I had no excuses. I had to do something really good. Something really extraordinary, I'd say. Yeah, well, thank you. I can't say that. You can say that. <laughs> <laughs> I think they might, uh, they might say that, too. Um, maybe we should take another uh, the video questions as well. And uh, if we have that. Hi, Jenny. My name is Arnold, and I'm from Puerto Rico. You have been a very important part in our lives, and we thank you for that. We consider you as one of the best composers in history. The question we have for you is what type of an influence have we been in your life as friends? And as fans, thank you. Wow. <laughs> I, like, I like he's got wow. his own score. Good. Yeah, <laughs> was, uh, I can see my influence on the yeah. kid. He played great, by the way, right? Yeah. He did it. The, the last thing, you, I'm, I'm glad he didn't do that Yanni head bob thing. With the hair. <laughs> 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 he was like, you leave it to the Puerto Rican people to be emotional and passionate. They're amazing. We've been on the island many, many times, and I love them, and they, they love us back. It's, um, the fans have been amazing, and it's been extremely important for me. And I'm not just saying that to be kind. Uh, um, even there was a time in my life, I'm going to make it short, that I, I got lost. I, I went through a, a depression. Um, I talk about it in my book from a few years ago. And um, of course, I ran home to Greece. I stayed with my mom and dad and stayed there and did not play the piano for a whole year, did not touch it. I just wanted to know that I could be a, a normal human being that there was a Yanni without the music. Um, and it took about a year before I got back into it. I got healed slowly, and thanks to, um, my sister was very clever. Back then, there was not, the internet was not that strong, so it was all handwritten letters. So she sent me a stack of fan letters, and that was the turning point. I started reading them, and then I started crying, and something burst inside me. I just realized that I had meaning to people out there, that I, I meant something. It wasn't, you know, you don't realize all this, how much effect you have. When you, if I could tell you the stories that I have been told, have been related to, it's, uh, they, they made me cry. It's pretty amazing what people do with my music, how they heal themselves, they use it to heal themselves. And I never wrote it for that reason. I never thought you could, I don't sit down to write music to heal anything. Other than maybe heal me, but the fans heal me as much as I heal them. They touch me as much as I touch them, sometimes even more. Well then maybe we should have another fan question. I think there's one more video one and then we can, uh, and, and then we'll, maybe we'll be able to open it up to the people here too. Okay. So why don't we go, go to the one more video one. Hi, Yanni. I am Abba from Brazil and I have a question. Children adore you. We have seen them attending your concerts all over the world. Or they even play your songs and post them on Facebook or YouTube. And this is not the musical style that children usually like. What is your secret? Why do you think that they love you so much? First of all, hi, Alba. I know Alba. <laughs> I've met her because I've been in Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro. They call it Rio de Janeiro down there. 
uh, yeah, I had to learn a little Portuguese too. Um, and uh, she has been very supportive and uh, we've met a few times. She comes to America to see me and uh, um, the answer to this is I think when I write a piece of music, I'm honest. I have never written music because it was um, this sells to now, so go manufacture some records or manufacture some music um, because that's what's selling now. Uh, I just write what is in my heart and in my soul and in my spirit, what, what my mind tells me, what my heart tells me, with, without regard whether it's going to sell or it's not going to sell. Um, I write music, there are no rules. I have no rules. I will use any instrument known to man as long as it uh, helps me express the emotion that I am trying to express. And I think if you are honest about your creation, and that goes for everything, everybody from writers to painters to musicians to any kind of creative work, um, if you're honest about your work, you're going to be original. There's only one of you. Just tell the truth. What does it feel like? What does life feel like to you? Let me know. And then I think for some reason, God-given gift, if you want to call it, I have the ability to, uh, to communicate it, to connect with people. People pick it up. They understand it. Maybe it's time to uh, entertain some questions here. Maybe if, if uh, we can get the lights up here. I'll try to get to everybody if I can. And I'm just going to go with the two hands right in front here because that's the way it works. That's what you look like back there. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Okay, I have to use the microphone. Okay. So, I'm Greek too. I was born in, um, in a Greek island, Rolos. Rolos? Rolos, no. Okay. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, um, I have a very um, strong relationship with fear. It's very difficult for me to handle it. And um, you, I don't want to sound dramatic, but when I listen to your music, I feel like I'm getting an idea of what it feels like not to be a prisoner of, of that horrible um, feeling. So I was wondering what, because you're such a great human and, and positive and, and really, really a beautiful human. And I was wondering what, what do you do or what happened or what gives you that force that really drives you and write this divine music that really, really affects all the people? Uh. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh. you, you're such a great speaker. <laughs> wow. 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 She just speaks fluent Greek too, by the way. I just heard it. See, can you see me here? Oh, I, I'm okay. Go back to my chair. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like you. This, 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 what you said is Stephanie. 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 Yeah. It. It is. Uh, you just touched my heart. Is that? That's exactly what I hear. That, and it makes me cry. That 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 you can do this. That when you you hear the music, it just gives you um, some relief or some faith in yourself. I. I'm, you know, we're not going to do a, a psychiatric evaluation right now, <laughs> but it, it, the fact that I that I can touch you like that is uh, it's pretty amazing. What heals me? You. Just what you said. With hearing you telling me that, it it comes right back. I have never given out that it hasn't come back. It always does. Just you have to do it. I know it sounds maybe Pollyannish, what I just said, but it's the truth for me. And uh, you're a great speaker. I a yeah, you are. You just, I heard you, right? Give it a round of applause, absolutely. Do, do, you, absolutely. do you ever get, 
I mean, some, some of the biggest performers in the world get stage fright. Do you ever get stage fright? Do you get butterflies before you go out? Do you get nervous? No. <laughs> no. Who, me? Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. no. If you don't get butterflies before you go on stage, you shouldn't be going on stage. It's, uh, yeah, to this day, I get, I get nervous. I get, you know, and the, the fear that you were talking about, it's a paper tiger. Just go right through it. It's nothing. It's, it's all in your mind. Don't be afraid. There's nothing to be afraid. What are you afraid of? Being a prisoner, as you put it, eloquently. It's, trust me, if you heard yourself, I, I will try to give you a recording of how you said what you said. Great speaker. Eloquently um, stated your position. Um, just go. Don't be afraid. That it's just shackles. It's just, you know, when I set out to go to um, places, I don't want to mention the names of the countries, I didn't know what I was going to find there. I didn't know. And when I started um, playing music, and I became 30 and 32, and I was still not being recognized, you think maybe I felt fear? That's when most of the bands quit and <laughs> become insurance salesmen or, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they still jam. They yeah. have fun. They jam. Yeah. All right, let's uh, try to get to as many as we can here. I'm going to go to the sure. back here, the gentleman in the, the person in the hat there. I can't quite see. Yes. I can't get all the way. Yes. Get the microphone? Don't well, I, we can repeat the question. You don't necessarily touch me as much as she does. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank you. I, I, <laughs> yes, how do you keep your youth for the people out how, Yeah, yeah. How do I keep my youth? Um, just being, <laughs> you're Greek. <laughs> it's, uh, I exercise, but not, I'm not fanatic about it. I watch what I'm eating, which is very difficult. You know, you have to especially when you're traveling through all these countries and they all have these delicacies and everybody wants you to taste everything they have and it's so amazing. And uh, try to be as happy as I can. That's the key. The key is uh, spiritually to be active and happy and, and try to maintain more of your, most of your time being positive in a positive state. You can't always do it. Don't think I'm not afraid. Don't think I... Don't get scared. Don't think I don't get depressed. I feel everything that all of you feel. It's the same thing. I just don't wallow in it. I just want to get out of it as quickly as possible. It does a lot of damage inside when you're holding on to things. You have to let things go. You have to... I actually say that in, um, during my concerts. is When I'm faced with a problem, I want to resolve it, face it, and release it as soon as possible. This way I'm free. And it's finished. You're done. And when you get that freedom, you, <laughs> you get an enormous amount of energy to use forward, to use for your future. Right, let's uh, try over here on the end, the, the gentleman there with the hand up there. We'll, get, we'll try to get as many people as we can. That's a great question, and it's a very difficult one to answer, too. I, I you know, um, there's nothing we can do about it. It's just the future. It's the, the wave of the future. Um, I personally, I prefer that I do an album and it goes out and uh, a billion people hear it, you know? Um, I don't really, I mean, I would wish they would just buy it. <laughs> it would be nice. Some of them do, which is very nice. But others may not be able to afford it, or they just share. It's, um, it's really changed the industry a lot, and, and it makes it very difficult for new artists to, to develop because there's no financing, there's no money, there's no support. It's very difficult. Um, 
I don't know what else to tell you. It's like you c it, it's unchangeable. Um, so I have embraced it. I, I expect that when I make an album, it may take me four years to make, and it's going to go out, and the next day it's going to be gone. It's like you'll sell a few, and then after that, everybody's sharing. But I don't mind going into the backwoods of, of um, China somewhere, and all of a sudden I'm hearing my music, and I'm watching uh, figure skaters uh, training to my music, and the fans walk up to me with CDs that I've never seen that say Yanni on it, and they... <laughs> and they <laughs> True story. <laughs> And they ask me to autograph them, and I go, oh, nice. I autograph it, and I go, which one is this one? <laughs> I want to say this, of, of the programs I've done here, this is the most hands I've ever seen go up for questions Good. here. I'm going to go to the back there, all the, toward the back, all the way. Point. Yes, yes, I am. Yeah. What was the last part? The music? Music? The last few words. Ah, of course. Did it, right, did it come out through the music you were yeah, playing? Was of reflected course, in that? Of course. Of course. Great question, by the way. I'm sorry, a lot of people are not going to hear it. Uh, we're supposed to have a microphone passed around. That's a great question. Um, yeah, I took into account what I said, how I said it, how we played, uh, what we sounded like. Um, we're very affected by what was going on. I, all of us, all the musicians. Um, it's one of the probably more, most, one of the most dramatic experiences in my life going to that country. And it's changed me forever. And they're very savvy in the social media in Tunisia. That's where the Arab Spring started, right? Do you remember that one? They're, they're very strong people. And I went there, and if you don't see them, and if you don't talk to them, you people I was talking to, they thought Tunisia was part of Europe. They didn't know it was in Africa. It's North Africa. So, and, and they're amazing people. And they stood up. They knew every song that every song that they played, they knew it. They would chant. They would, it was probably one of the best audiences I've ever seen um, and experienced. Um, again, I told you it was like it took us a long time. It made me cry. <laughs> we couldn't sleep that night. You get to the hotel and you you you're. And I wasn't sure that I was making the right decision. To, to play that kind of music, in, but there's, I, have, I guess I have so many fans there. Because the next time we're going to play the stadium, it's going to be, you know, they're already start talking about it. It's, um, we're going back. It's, it's an amazing experience. I want to go. I want to be there. Okay. <laughs> You're on. So let's go up front here, the woman in the green hat there. Great. Oh, we're going we're yeah. to bring a mic around here. So oh, we're microphone. Good. I can get the front. It's no problem. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Yanni. It's Hi. good to see you again. You probably know I've been nagging you for years about Egypt. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I wondered if you are ever, I mean, you are the perfect person to perform there. I've been All to right. one concert there, but you probably know who it was. But uh, I can't imagine that's the one country I would love to see you perform there. Uh, Is it you. possible? I, of course it is possible. We came very close. Uh -huh. We came very close to really? getting it done. Oh, yeah, a couple of years ago, but the situation is not quite right. Okay. And we had so many fans in Egypt. Yes, It's, it's a ma just a matter of time. I absolutely. think we're very close. It's going to happen, okay. and it's going to be huge there. Well, I can't wait be to there. come. Yes. 
Thank you. Thank you for the question. Right, um, right in the middle with the glasses. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yanni, the 20 year burning question. Oh boy. <laughs> no, wait, 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 wait. Do I need to brace myself? What's going on yes. here? <laughs> and I use this term loosely as a former rocker because <laughs> I've seen you run out in leathers. That was so cool. <laughs> oh, you want, you've seen leather pants. Yeah. Don't say oh, that. Oh, you don't oh, forget it. Oh. Just, like, uh, <laughs> I liked so it. It great. was fine. It was fine. <laughs> I would like to know what your feelings were about Elvis Presley. I loved him. I loved him. It's a great. It's, it's, it's tragic. His life and how he got lost is horrible. But it happens to a lot of great talent. They just don't understand what's happening to them. They can't deal with it. They don't figure it out, and they think they just keep postponing and postponing and. We lose them. I love. I mean, I loved them when I was a kid in Greece growing up. That was all this. I mean, yeah. That was it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. That's why I wear leather pants. <laughs> <laughs> why, why don't you just uh, hand it to the woman right next to you there in the white there? We'll make it to the Hi, Yanni. Hi. Um, so glad to see you again. My question is when you come out on stage, mm -hmm. you sit down at the piano, before you play your first note, what are the thoughts going through your mind? Uh, I've already focused so much before I um, walk on that stage. I'm, I'm alone in my dressing room for at least an hour. I get to shut everything out. If, if I have problems, everything else has to go away. I have to know where I'm at. <laughs> Don't forget the city I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> That's, a no, no. That's a no-no. That's a no-no. Never mind, I don't remember the hotel we're staying at or the floor we're on. Forget the room number. <laughs> I don't know any of that stuff. Um, it's, um, again, I surrender. It's part of the, the whole thing. I just give, it's 100% or nothing. So I was, it's like the creative process. You're either on full time. I try to do it where you just do it casually and it's not so, you know, you don't have to work so hard and it doesn't work. It's you're on. It's a hundred percent of yourself. You give it to the audience and they feel it and they connect with you right back and it creates this vortex that elevates. And by the end of the night it's a whole other situation and it's everywhere we've been, everywhere in the world it's the same. It's the same. It just every concert is a little different, but it ends the same. I just wanted to follow up. You, s you said that um, every time you come out, you are nervous. Um, now, does that go away after you play your first song? Oh, that's where you were going with this. Um, the, ner the, the nervousness that I have is, a, is, is, is a, it's an excitement. It's not fear. Uh, it used to be fear. <laughs> <laughs> when I was starting out, yeah, I forgive that. Uh, now it's a, it gives you a shot of adrenaline. You're just all of a sudden you get very energetic, and when you're on stage, time slows down. It's like you're moving much faster than the audience. I've seen recordings of me making mistakes or something going wrong, and I saw it. Two minutes went by, and it was really 15 seconds. It's like the Matrix kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> it is true. This is true because your heart rate goes up. So all of a sudden you're just moving at a higher speed than everybody else, which is very useful if you're playing live because you can cover up your mistakes, <laughs> which you're going to make. Yeah. You never saw me make a mistake because I was going fast. <laughs> Okay, the, why we, I'm, I'm going to make you run all over the place here. No, no, but <laughs> just the gentleman, right, the gentleman right there is fine to start with, and then we'll go to the next I love this. Keep one. going. <laughs> First of all, I want you to know that I've bought every DVD and CD you ever produced from Amazon. Thank you. <laughs> and a few years ago, I read that, you know, as good as you were, that you don't actually read or write music, and you said some things tonight that you don't know. And ever since then, I've been totally confused at how you can produce all this stuff without reading and writing music. Yeah. So the other quick question I'd like to ask is, is there's some way you could ever put these two really beautiful performances at the Taj Mahal and also Acropolis in a Blu-ray? In a Blu-ray? Yeah. Um, they were recorded on PAL, 
actually it's a, the European system. The, the high definition was never uh, invented yet. Uh, but PAL is pretty close to high def. It was the European version of television. It's much, much higher quality. It's quite beautiful. Uh, yeah, thank you. But you thank know, Elvis, uh, they've got some Elvis, old Elvis concerts. Uh, that <laughs> <laughs> that uh, have been converted to I want to answer your first question, which I've forgotten already. <laughs> uh, if, if you can do you or do you not read and write All oh, right, there you go. Thank you. Well, okay. You have your own. Yeah, it, yeah it is. It, it, First of all, what you have to realize is that music lies in the auditory system, right? It's not visual. When you translate any piece of sound onto a piece of paper with some black dots on some lines, whichever way you want to do it, um, you'd be lucky if you get 50 or 60 percent written down on the paper. I know that because now you don't need to write anything down. I just record it. And then I give it to people. I, the computer already knows all the notes I've just played. It spits it out, and it's written on a piece of paper. It's not perfect. And then they correct whatever errors the computer made. Um, and then I have to sit with the musicians and, and say, no, not like this, a little more like that, a little more like this, a little more like that. There's a lot of information how you play a song. Yeah, now, when we're hearing uh, an orchestra interpret their version of any Beethoven song, maybe if Beethoven heard it performed like that, he may just turn over in his grave, you know? <laughs> it's like, we don't know what it sounded like. Just because it's written on a piece of paper, it doesn't mean you get it. When I was a kid, and I was afraid that uh, I would forget something that I thought was a great melody just hit me, um, I wrote it down, I, I, I created my own shorthand, musical shorthand. And it looks sort of like hieroglyphics, kind of, it's strange looking. But it's very accurate, and it reminds me um, everything that I was thinking of. And uh, over the years, believe it or not, my musical memory, of course, expanded. So I tend to not forget anything that I have written. It comes back. And if you do that since you're a kid, of course your brain accommodates you, creates more neurons in that area, and does that answer your question? It's not necessary. Thank you. You're welcome. How, how many more do you think we can do? It's up to you. How, how many more would you like to do? I love this. Keep going until they all leave. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> what else is he going to say, right? Uh, so he's going to make me be the bad guy eventually. <laughs> <laughs> So let's, uh, why don't we take a couple in the back and then we'll come back up to the front and then we'll see where we are in time. I think we'll probably, that might do it, maybe two in the back and two in the front. That may be what we have time for, I think. Sure. We'll do what we can. <laughs> Go. All right, so back there, yes, that's fine. Yanni, first of all, I'd like to say it's unbelievably amazing to see you. Thank um, you. I am first generation born here, but my family is from Iran. They escaped before revolution. So I saw that a lot of times growing up, I found myself in the house and my parents were playing Yanni. I'd go to my uncle's, I'd go to my family's house, and everyone's serving and they'd be playing Yanni. And I saw that the, your music bridged a gap with me being here and my um, family's culture, which I started eventually um, loving my own music, my, my you know, Iranian music. I want to ask you a specific question because I don't know all your songs are my favorite. Um, I can't really choose one, but what's your favorite song and what's, this, what's the reason behind it that it would be your favorite mm -hmm. uh, that you've p composed? Because it's done so much for me. Well, first of all, I can't overlook your question. It's amazing. I know we have so many Iranian fans they're, they're asking me all the time to do a concert there, and we are going to go there. We're going to go there. Thank you. Yeah, we are. And, I mean, we were doing a concert in, in uh, Yerevan, in Armenia. And uh, a lot of uh, Iranian people got on an airplane from Tehran and flew over, and they were at the concert in Armenia. Something amazing also happened the last time we were at Yerevan. Two kids from Tehran 
got on mountain bikes and they rode 1,200 kilometers through the rain and the cold and the sleet and they made it at 6 o'clock that night before the show. And I pointed them out to the audience towards the end and it was the biggest highlight of the whole concert. I was jealous. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, as far as the, what's my favorite song, I, I can't pick. I, it's, uh, of course I love Felicia, I mean, that's a nice one. It's just my mother, it's, 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 they're all, they're, I, I cannot, I'm sorry. Just, uh, I like this one, I like this one, I like this one for different reasons. And um, I'm, I tend to be passionate about the song I'm creating in the moment, I think that's the best one at the time, and then I'm always in the moment, I'm always surrendering, remember? That's what that word means, it's just like give up. You take yourself out of the way, become one with the music, surrender, and then here comes Felita. The whole song shows up. And it, it's not a laborious, uh, the most effortless part is the creative part, and it's the, the life-giving part. The part that keeps me young, it's right there. It's the part that, that makes me feel alive. It's like, because you're, you're facing the black, you're facing the unknown, and out of the unknown, that's where all the music is. Everything. And um, when it materializes, you realize you just made something out of nothing. It's very, um, a very powerful feeling to have. Thank you for your question. Why don't you pick, just pick somebody back there and... Uh Hi, uh, I wanted to ask you, do, sorry, do you have a favorite musician? Ah, musician, I love a lot of them, I mean, it's not, again, see, I'm not big on my best uh, song, favorite musician, it's, it's all in the moment, it just de depends, you know, what's, your, what's the best time in your life? Well, I, you know, it's, it depends, it's in the moment. When I was 14 years old, I broke the Greek national record in freestyle swimming. Was that my best time in my life? At the time, yes, it was. But then I played at the Acropolis. That was my, the best time in my life, too. Then the Taj Mahal and the Forbidden City, and then and it just keeps on going. Beating my depression, best time in my life. You know, you keep going. It's, there's, there is no, I cannot choose one. It's, it's a um, continuum. It's just, it all happens at once. It sounds a little strange, but okay. A, why don't we? Uh, the woman right here has been uh, <laughs> very. Right there. Sure. Thank you so much, Yanni. I'm so just filled with so much joy and gratitude to be here, and thank you for your wisdom and love and music. Um, you said that the ancients spoke to you and led you to the Acropolis where you felt that you touched immortality. And your music speaks to generations mm -hmm. and lives as a spiritual monument in the soul of humanity. How does that make you feel? A, thank you for saying that. So, <laughs> you know, I grew up in a place called Kalamata, Greece, 30 miles west of Kalamata. Uh, is Sparta. 30 miles northeast of Kalamata is the ancient Olympia. The first one, the 25 year old stadium that me and my brother got inside and started running around. There's so much history where we came from, where I was born. Everywhere you look at the Parthenon and um, it's stunning that people created these kind of monuments that stood the test of time. So. I was thinking when I started writing music, what could I possibly do that would last more than a week? <laughs> or like, maybe a year, people are gonna hear a song, a year later they can go, okay, next one, and I can't hear this one anymore. Um, and yet, th th every artist strives for that. We all strive for, to, to create things that stand the test of time. All of us, the painters, the writers, the, the, the movie makers, the whatever art you're into. It's the same thing. And we all go to the same place to be creative, by the way. There's no difference. Everybody has to do the same thing. Creativity is... Anyway, um, 
back to your uh, ultimately I will never know um, because I can't decide that you have to decide that and the ultimate judge is time and um, I have nothing to do with it I have to create be honest um, give myself a hundred percent and then the result will speak for itself. You're a global mirror and have shown us uh, how to live. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. She said in Greek, uh, from the bottom of my heart, thank you very much for this. Uh, this this is going to be difficult, but we have one time for one. Do we have time for one more? And I, I'm, I apologize to everybody who doesn't. Question. Yeah, oh. it's almost like throw the microphone and see who gets. It's like the bouquet, right? <laughs> I really don't know. I'm going to let the. Uh, he's just going to. This is He's internet, stoic. right? We can cut any. It was fine. Like the people, they can stay on. We don't care. Well, <laughs> <laughs> if, we, if we put out the DVD of this, they're yeah. going to copy it, and it's going to be. Okay. Uh, oh my God, I'm so honored to talk to you tonight. Uh, first of all, I love you. I love your music, and your music always always been a source of inspiration and courage in my life, and I respect you for that. Thank you. Um, I've always been interested to follow the pattern in your life, in your music, through your life. And uh, my question is, what are your plans for the future in terms of composing? Are you gonna to get back to original music, or you wanna continue doing voices, or you wanna switch genres, or just uh, uh. what are you gonna to like do with your future uh, professional life? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for what you said. It's, it's, it's a great question, too. I mean, the, I have no idea what I'm going to do, first of all. I remember what I said, I'm open-minded. You have to approach life with an open mind. And most of us, as we go through life, we, and we get hurt. And uh, pretty soon, life closes in on us. And that's what I'm trying not to have happen. It's, it's like, it doesn't matter where you've been, what you've done, how famous you are, how rich you are. It's like, what is left of you now after you've been through all this? That's the important thing. How much of the little Yanni is still here? The one that had all the dreams and the aspirations and uh, the no fear part. You know, how much? Uh, it, that's the important things. Um, it's very likely I, I will start writing music again. I just don't know what kind, what type. I have been exposed right now to so many different things, so many different cultures, so many different cities and countries, and, and, and the future is actually accelerating now with Egypt and Morocco probably, and there's going to be quite a lot of South Africa I haven't been at. We're going to go there. I have, I've had people in Sudan come to the concerts. And they're asking on the internet, if you get on our page, you'll see they're writing from all over the world. Touches my heart. And if I can be a, a positive influence wherever I appear, then I will go, as long as they invite me. And I, I'm pretty much certain that I'm going to be a positive influence. But no single human being can heal the ills of our, the plague our world. It's impossible. But we all can all do our part. And I think that I am doing mine. And why don't you all just keep giving, giving yourselves an applause because you did a wonderful job for the questions tonight. Thank you so much for helping that. And tremendous amount of thanks. This was such an honor and thrill for me to be able to moderate this event tonight. I want to thank you so much, Yanni. Awesome job, you, Steve. You've got a great... You. <laughs> awesome job. I know you, I'm sure many of you are going to see him tomorrow night, right? Yeah. 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 Which will be incredible. And uh, let's do this again sometime. Yeah, soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Great Please people. Thank you. Thank you.